Good morning, everybody in Facebook land and podcast land. Welcome to Mike Springston FFC Podcast. It is the 13th day of April of 2024. It's about 1037 in the morning on Saturday morning. We're glad to be coming with you to, uh, to you with another podcast. We're talking about how dominion was accomplished by Jesus Christ. Uh, we're going to pick up in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 2 and 3 in just a moment, but we want to welcome all of our listeners from around the world. Um, I appreciate you studying with us. Remember, you can contact us at uh, um, springston56 at gmail.com, mikespringstonministries.com, ffcma.org, or through Family Fellowship Chapel's direct messaging. We appreciate you. We thank you for listening uh, and sharing with us, and we look forward to this study today. So let's open our eyes and our ears in prayer. Father, we pray that you'd open our eyes that we could see, our ears that we could hear, and our heart that we could understand what the Word of God says to us, and then that we would be changed into the image of your dear Son by applying it to our lives. We ask that Jesus would speak to us. Show us what we need to know, do, understand, and demonstrate, and we'll receive it and give it to your people. And as we do, we'll be changed, we'll be corrected, and we'll be brought in to truth. We ask it all in the lovely name of Jesus Christ, who is our high priest, our Lord, and our man in the Godhead. Amen and amen. So how it is accomplished? How is dominion accomplished? How was it done by Jesus Christ? Let's pick up here in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 2. That their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love, and unto all riches of the fullness of understanding. Now that's a key phrase in this scripture, the fullness of understanding. To the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and the Father and of Christ. Then in verse 3, in whom are all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Paul in verse 2 uh, says there is a mystery of God, and he's going to unfold that mystery when he gets to chap verse 9 of chapter 2. So the question is, who is God, and why is there a distinction in Colossians that causes Paul to identify the Father, Christ, and God? As we move a bit further, as I mentioned in chapter 2, Paul is going to declare who Jesus Christ is with respect to that Godhead. He's going to do that by saying, For in Him, in Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So there is a mystery which Paul is defining for us as he writes this book. And that mystery is the Godhead. The Godhead consists, of course, of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and how they have operated to direct the universe and the creation. And that becomes the mystery. In this writing, we identify the use of the Holy Spirit upon Paul in Colossians 1, 8 and 9, 2, 9 and 3, 16. So it's clear that Paul has exposed the Godhead in this writing. Therefore, when he addresses Christ Jesus in reference to the man in the Godhead bodily, of whom we are complete in him, we can identify now the entire expanse of the Godhead through Paul's writing in Colossians. So, of course, that brings us now to know that God is a trinity, he is composed of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we often use Paul's term and refer to them as being a Godhead. In the Godhead, those three distinct people have three distinct functions or offices. The Godhead has and is the supreme divinity. From here, the complete divine plan of God was designed and revealed. It included the creation of earth and man. It included the means to deal with Satan in his position of raising and rearing his head to attempt to want to be equal with God. It included the remedy for the fall of man. It then brings about the insertion of the Son of God as the messenger and ultimate Savior. 
It includes the work of the Holy Spirit to be able to replicate the messaging and produce the end results as designed by the divine plan of God. This also included the plan to cause Jesus to, re to regain the dominion that Adam gave away by his treasonous actions. In completing the work, there had to be a work accomplished both in the earth and a work accomplished in the spiritual world. That work was the development and the initiation of the plan we call salvation. These six phases of salvation had to be completed and overseen by the Holy Spirit as he traveled with Jesus, according to Hebrews chapter 9, as he traveled with Jesus. So I want you to notice that the acts of the development of the plan of salvation, there were three witnesses. There were three witnesses involved with this to ensure that the work of the plan of salvation was accomplished completely. Now the father looked on. We know that because we saw him having to turn his face when Jesus was put upon by sin. The Holy Spirit went along with Jesus and was the one who gave him through each phase. And Jesus, of course, executed the physical and the spiritual deeds. So there were three involved in this. The Father looked on, the Holy Spirit went along, and Jesus executed the deeds. So the six phases of salvation that had to be overseen were these. There had to be healing offered through the cross that brought forgiveness. There had to be preservation of the spirit that was brought about through the burial of that put upon with sin flesh that we call the tomb. There had to be deliverance from the grip of Satan through the resurrection of which we know that this was the promise of which Jesus executed the entire operation, that God would not leave his soul in hell or him to see corruption. So we see in the first three works the earthly side. Now then when we get to the third work, the deliverance phase, we see him come out of there robed in righteousness and nothing but his voice being the same as it was. So these first three phases transformed Jesus. And this is why Paul identifies the resurrection as the saving element, because it is there that death and hell released its grasp and the promise of him not being left corrupted became reality. He was delivered from there. Then we go into the three spiritual works of salvation. The first one, we see Jesus. Now we understand that from the resurrection for you and I, a spiritual work has transpired. Jesus told Mary, I'm going to my father and your father. And the book of Hebrews tells us what he did. When we come out of the phase of deliverance, where we believe and accept the deliverance of the resurrected Savior, we become adopted, we become the elect children of God, and we become sealed and marked by the power of the blood. But that is where we go. Jesus went to be the high priest over his own sacrifice, sprinkling that blood 
so that that blood could be released to you and me to bring us into the righteous condition of adoption, election, and sealed with that blood. That produced for us what they want to tell us happened for us at the cross. But this spiritual action produced for us the eternal safety, what they call eternal security. It is there. It is just not there at the juncture, at the place of which they want to put it. Then the exalted Jesus Christ became Lord, and there the dominion of heaven, earth, and hell, all three worlds, were placed back in his hand, and the structure of those three worlds became sound under the reign and the rule of the Lord. Now then, he operated them from the seven spirits of God. He operated in them, ruling and reigning from wisdom, understanding, counsel, might, knowledge, reverence, and judgment. Out of those seven spirits of God, Isaiah 11, chapter chapter 11 and verses 1 through 4, tells us that he operates them out of righteousness. So he's operating from the total dominion. And then lastly, the sixth phase was the sending of the promise of the Father to baptize the church in the Holy Spirit and to provide the church now with his wholeness. That meant that he would dwell in you, the Holy Spirit would dwell in you, The Father would dwell in you, and you would be complete in them. And he would speak through the Holy Spirit that would minister to you in soul and show you, lead you, guide you, give you what to speak, and show you great things that are to come. So in this sixth plan, six-phase plan, we had healing, Preservation, deliverance, safety, soundness, and wholeness. All of these are crucial because if dominion had not been brought back into the earth, then wholeness could not have come back into the earth. But when dominion was won, then Jesus Christ had the opportunity to deliver uh, unto us and to give unto us the thing that would allow the Godhead to dwell in us. And Christ taught us this in John 14, 15, 16. And Paul is teaching this to us in Colossians. Now, in these phases, the plan of God, not only for man, but for the entire world is expressed and provided so that the entire creation of God can be brought back under those who believe, living out of them. Dominion has been retrieved and placed back in the earth and back in its correct position. The earth has been provided with the wholeness of this operation. The church has been provided with the ability by Jesus Christ, the man in the Godhead bodily, to reproduce the things that he began to do and to teach. Because he could, through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, speak and use man to reproduce himself. The work is inclusive. And what the Father has done to send his love, now listen to this, What the Father has done to send His love, who is the only one of His kind, the only one that could do it, the only one that was able to do it, God sent the one of His kind, His dearly beloved, His love. He commended His Son to us while we were yet in sin. The world was still held under the bondage and captivity of Satan. The Father who loved the Son and who gave His dearly beloved, 
son to be the sacrifice. Here, Paul says in Colossians 2.2, that we must have full understanding of the Father's love for the Son and what was expressed in the Son's absolute perfection. As we know, when it comes to the sacrifice, any spot or blemish annulled the sacrifice. So when the Father sent the Son of whom he loved, made him to be absolutely perfect in his love, that sacrifice now had both the internal, which made the external to be absolutely sinless, spotless, and blemishless. So, As Christ came, he came as the perfect representation of the love of the Father. No other way could he be perfect. No other way could he have come into this earth, lived and walked among mankind without having absolute perfection of the God of love operating in him and through him. Now Christ then showed his love to mankind by laying down his life for them. He was the perfect representation that God commended to the sinner, which was him in his, operating in his perfect, perfect, Love, no spot, no blemish. That's what God's love is. That's what God's love demanded. That Jesus Christ come and be sinless. Him who knew no sin represents and reflects where and how God sent his love to man through a perfect, absolute sacrifice whom he knew because of the love that he shared and gave to him in the creation of Christ, that love would be absolutely blemishless and thereby be able to stand the legal test that had been provided in the Old Testament, in the First Testament, for every sacrifice that had to be given. So Jesus came in the complete and perfect operation of blemishless love. And God gave that love to his one of a kind. There has never been a man born since Adam other than the branch that came through the seed of Jesse, Jesus Christ, who was born by Mary, birthed by Mary, whose father was God, whose inner self was full of the love of God, there's never been another man who could be that sacrifice. There's never been another man who exposed, expressed, was commended the love to be able to be that sacrifice except Jesus Christ. So when the Father sent the Son, His love was exposed in the Son through the utter and absolute perfection of His person, His character, His nature, His inner self, And his actions. Now then. There is the mystery. Of Jesus Christ. Christ came. As the dearly beloved. Son of God. As we know. He was the only one. Of his kind. Never been another man born like him. We now know. What made him. The only one of his kind. 
And that was the perfect love of which he was designed and conceived by the Father. Jesus lived and ministered the Spirit to a people who were not born with perfect love because they rejected his word. We are a people that do not understand the perfect love of Jesus Christ or the perfect love of the Father that was represented in Jesus Christ. So what, did, what does rejection do? Well, they crucified him. And therefore, because of the love that was in him, in his makeup, because of who he was, he was able to be the legal sacrifice. The only means to be the legal sacrifice. He's the only one of his kind, full of the love of God. So he became the atonement for sin. And he paid the price. And I'm going to do a, a, a podcast here shortly on the last words of Jesus and what they meant. It is finished. You don't want to miss it. He completed the journey of the phases that are associated with salvation. He did it in the earth and he did it in the spiritual realm. He successfully accomplished each step as it was overseen both by the Father and the Spirit. Hebrews called the Spirit the eternal Spirit in Hebrews 9. Now then, he was accepted in the Beloved and exalted as Lord. This exaltation made him to be Lord over everything. This lordship made him to rule and reign over all creation in all three worlds. The works of life and life of Jesus Christ are reproduced in man through the work of salvation as I've already defined. They are completed by the Holy Spirit now as he replicates the works completed in the lives of those who follow Jesus. On the earthy side, he does this through reproof or convicting and convincing. On the spiritual side, he seals and approves. Here, the works completed by Jesus Christ are distributed to man as an inheritance. And this is done by the Holy Spirit using the term Paul called the earnest payments or down payments to reveal in man the promises of God to the followers of Christ. As the Holy Spirit operates in man, our soul, the follower's soul, is experiencing the Creator Jesus developing Himself to us from the inner man. Since He is the Creator of the inner man, and He paid the price to reconnect our inner man to God, and since he has been made Lord over all things, then we have him manufacturing himself in our spirit, according to Ephesians 2 and 10. He speaks to us from our spirit through our soul. The Holy Spirit is the voice that appears in our soul to lead us and guide us and show us the things that are to come and give us what to speak. This is a dynamic coordination of this mystery. The Creator is in us operating in our inner man in order to bring us into the image of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is in our soul describing the pattern that the Creator is developing in our inner man. The outcome then is the grand design of the Creator coming through our spirit coming through our spirit and as he does so, operating that spirit through our soul, this informs our flesh of how we are to live as we portray Jesus Christ to our world. So now we've unraveled the mystery of Christ and what he is doing 
in you, how He is doing it. We've also unraveled the mystery of how He is functioning through you. As well, we have unraveled the messaging of what the Holy Spirit is doing as He works through your soul to control the things that the flesh is doing. This is a lovely picture of the divine work that God has revealed to us in Paul's messaging. In Christ, who is the victoriously anointed one, who has delivered, been delivered, by being risen from the dead, now all of the treasures that are available are hidden in this Godhead and in Christ Jesus. Now why are they hidden in Christ? That seems like a good question. The mystery of God, the Father and the Son have been revealed. The Spirit's work has been revealed, but the things that we seem to need the most seem by Paul's writing to be hidden from us. This is very, very far from the truth, my friend. As we saw in verse 2, there's been a way made into the truths. But in order to get them, we have to go into those truths to get them. So we have to pursue truth and pursue the depths of spiritual opportunities that are prepared for us by the actions of Jesus Christ. Paul said in verse 3, In whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now we must identify that since there has been a means to know the mystery, as we've just described, if there is a means to know the mystery, then there also is a means to find out what's been hid and why it's been hid there. Being hid does not mean that they are unretrievable. They are undetectable or that they are unattainable. It means that as Paul says in Colossians 3, they are to be sought after. The key to understanding the means to find what you are looking for is to seek ye then. If ye be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above. What's that mean? Well, of course, it means that we're only going to go there when we leave the earthy and come into the spiritual because it's going to be ascertained, understood. It's going to be obtained by the Spirit. Paul tells us that in 1 Corinthians 2. Here's the issue. Most of us do not desire to go into the place where we must go in order for the Spirit to be able to reveal those treasures. Because those treasures are things that I have not seen or earth heard, but have been prepared for those who are called and who love the Lord. We don't want to go there because that requires commitment. That requires us putting ourselves in the position where people say, oh, he's too spiritual minded. He's got heaven on his mind too much. He's got this thing so bad that he, he just not even act like he in this world. Well, my friend, if we're going to come into the image of Christ, be citizens of heaven and be ruled by the kingdom of Jesus Christ, we're going to have to become very spiritually minded. The problem with our world today is we're not spiritual minded. We're self-minded. Without being spiritually minded, my friend, the things of God are going to remain hidden. We reject the life of living and walking in the Spirit because no one tells us of the necessity to live and walk in... Oh, wait a minute, I'm wrong. Paul told you that in Galatians chapter 5. Paul said if we're going to live in the Spirit, we're going to have to walk in the Spirit. But we want to be so earthly-minded... We want to be attached to earthy things. We want to be attached to family and friends. And we want to be attached to this, my job, and uh, all of the earthly things that we make as idols. And therefore, we miss out on what God has devised and designed for us 
and what the Spirit of God is trying to reveal to us. They all tell you that you've gotten all the Holy Spirit that you will ever need when you got saved. And that, of course, my friend, is an absolute unfounded statement. The Holy Ghost reproved, which means he convicts and convinces of sin. That's his earthly work. But in his spiritual work, he seals, which means he approves based upon the blood and marks the follower as being, watch this word, unreprovable. Unreprovable. They no longer require conviction and convincing. They're unreprovable. That means that in Christ Jesus, when we go over into his spiritual work, that we become as blameless as he is. We're no longer open to censure, according to Colossians 1.22. So you see, my friend, there is a spiritual work that is beyond what the Holy Ghost does in the earthy work. And we want to tell people you've got all you got when you got saved. And it's unfortunate because the messaging of Paul does not teach that. The messaging of Paul tells us that we can go into a place where we no longer operate in the Holy Spirit under that office. We don't operate under him in the office of reproof anymore. We operate in him in the office of sealing by the blood that makes us unreprovable. That means he makes us through the blood that was sprinkled for our sanctification and brotherhood to become absolutely approved under the same approvalship that Jesus Christ was approved according to Peter in Acts chapter 2. Then the Holy Spirit reveals to us as he shows us now from this unreprovable, spotless, and blameless spiritual perspective as he shows us the things that I have not seen nor ear heard, neither has entered into the heart of man, but has been revealed to us by the Spirit. Now, is he going to reveal the deep things of God that I have not seen nor ear heard to those of whom he is constantly reproving of sin? No, my friend. He's going to reveal to those who have come over into the spiritual side and are living approved and are unreprovable. They're going to be the ones that are living in a place where the things that God has prepared for those who love him, the things that he's given to them, and the Holy Spirit is going to reveal it to them. No, you didn't get everything you needed when you got saved. You didn't get all the Holy Ghost you needed when you got saved. You just run the plan of salvation, and the last part of that plan is going to take you not into a reprovable, unreprovable perspective. That is occurring as you cross into righteousness and sanctification. That is occurring as you come into the Lordship of Jesus Christ. There is a place where you can go. And that place is into the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And that is executed out of the Godhead. Well, it's, it's, it's there, it's Scripture, whether we choose to believe it or not. We can reject whatever we want, but we reject it to our own peril. Of course, the first side is the earthy operation, the second is the spiritual operation, and the third is the divine operation of the Holy Spirit. If we bottle him into the earthy work, he has no means to be exposed to the works accomplished in the spirit world or the works accomplished in the manifestation of the divine side of Jesus Christ. What then do we seem to lack? Well, we lack wisdom and we lack knowledge. How are these to be exposed to us? We know that both of these are parts of the seven spirits of God that were exposed by Jesus Christ. We know that wisdom is good judgment that comes from experience. 
A man expresses this when he uses all of his experiences to best decide on a course of action. Knowledge is the acquiring of facts and information that comes from also experience and or education that are germane to a situation and that allow for the most understanding concerning that situation. These two vital pieces are both in Christ and await us to go into the locations in Him from which we can access and utilize His wisdom and knowledge. This is not a place, my friend, that has any earthly implications. It's a spiritual place that has a heavenly economy. There are treasure that awaits the follower who requires the wealth of the deposit that is transferable and available. How will this deposit be released? Paul tells us in Ephesians 1.14, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of His glory. Did you see that? Until the redemption, you're going to come into Him through the Spirit. And you're going to, to receive your eternal inheritance through the down payments of the Spirit. Until the time when Jesus comes. We receive the down payment of our inheritance through the word of Jesus Christ, operating through the Holy Spirit to minister portions of our inheritance to us now. This is completed by the blood that was sprinkled in the tabernacle that both sanctified us and made us brothers. From here, Hebrews 2 tells us that he declares now the name of God in the midst of the church. I've got more on this topic, but I'm going to have to finish here. Father, I pray that you'll minister to your people, that as we understand the Lordship of Jesus Christ and the work that you've done in the Spirit of which we must come into, and as we understand how the Spirit delineates how He works in the earth and how He works in the Spirit, understanding that, God, may we seek those things that are above. I bless you now and I praise you in the lovely name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Hi, Charles. It's good to see you this morning. May God bless you, my friends. We'll be going into a teaching on the blood. Looking forward to show on the last words of Jesus Christ. That's what we'll be teaching next. 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 Hi, Miss, uh, Joey Michelle. That's what we'll be teaching next. Uh, the blood that uh, was shed at the cross. That's where we'll be going the next time. And we'll be talking about what did Jesus mean when he said, it is finished. God bless you. We love you, Charles. Love you, Joey and Michelle. And appreciate all those of you that come on to our uh, Facebook and podcast. May God richly bless you tomorrow morning at 1030. We hope to see you in the house of God. God bless. Friends, find him as Lord and you'll find him as the man and the God. You'll find him as the one who released the name to you. Find him as the man and the Godhead bodily. And there you'll find him as him who will show you great and mighty things that are to come. May God bless you is my prayer.